for people that don't know what a marker is, it's clicker training. So people are probably more familiar with that. Right. It's basically the first thing that we do when we start our training journey with our dog. We need them to understand what this concept is. All right. So because people might hear the word marker and think, oh, what does that mean? So it can mean multiple things, right? It could be a clicker or a, or a word. That's it. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. Or both. Yeah. 100%. At the same time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Episode four, here we are. We're, here, we're back again, brother. All right, what are we doing today? Today, we're going to be talking about conditioning. We're going to talk about the importance of a marker, and we'll explain that in a moment. For people that don't know what a marker is, it's clicker training. So, people are probably more familiar with that. Right. It's basically the first thing that we do when we start our training journey with our dog. We need them to understand what this concept is. All right. So, because people might hear the word marker and think, oh, what does that mean? So, okay. it can mean multiple things, right? It could be- a clicker or a, or a word. That's it. Yeah, or both. Yeah. Or both. Yeah, at 100%. the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. but before we talk about the function of it, we should talk a little bit about the background and understanding classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning. So, I guess the first thing we'll talk about is Pavlovian conditioning. So, Ivan Pavlov was a scientist around the 1900s. He was testing the digestive system of the dog. It was a big food paste machine with a tube connecting to the dog's mouth, another tube connecting to the dog's gland. See how much will they salivate every time the food was in their mouth. There was also a bell. Mm -hmm. So, the bell would ring, the dog would get fed, the dog would then salivate. Yeah. And over and over again, this experiment went on. And one day, the food paste machine stopped working. And when the bell rang, the dog started to salivate. Right. So, they'd been conditioned to hear the bell and salivate regardless of the food. Exactly. Right. With good timing. So, every time that bell rang, food went into that dog's mouth immediately. Yeah. And um, as it went on over and over again, when no food went into that dog's mouth, the dog heard that bell, salivation occurred. And and that wasn't the intention of it. He was just testing how salivation and food was all coming together. And he had this bell because he had issues in regards to how he was doing this because every time Pavlov was rocking up to the experiment with food in the dogs, well, I mean, with food in the bowls, yeah. the dog seen it and then were already starting to salivate. So right. he was trying to come up with a different way. And that was when the penny dropped for him when that when that bell rang. No food came, but the dog still salivated. This was the, the birth of, we call it Pavlovian conditioning, or it's also called classical conditioning. So, this sort of conditioning happens to us all the time. You hear that song, oh, good times. Yeah. You smell that perfume and it reminds you of someone straight away. So, when one event leads to another event repeated consistently over time, us and dogs will make these connections and these associations. This is, and so then this leads us to the next point about understanding what instrumental conditioning is. So, um, the famous experiment was um, with Skinner and the and the box. So Skinner and the box is the is the experiment that that is well known. And he had a whole bunch of pigeons inside um, this little box. And basically, every um, he was trying to sh show the pigeons that every time they hit this little um, lever. Food will then come out, mm -hmm. and then they started to understand. And the and the understanding of instrumental conditioning is that every behavior has a consequence. Right. So um. So this is important for dogs and for dog training because dogs can only be reinforced or punished for their behavior within one point six seconds of that behavior. How did they discover that it was one point six seconds? Do you know, or where is it, where where did you learn that from? I learned that from the course that I was doing. NDTF. The NDTF. Yeah. Okay. Um. It's kind of common understanding now. Right. It's such a specific measurement, isn't so it? So specific. Yeah. And I think it's where, as the studies go on, we're starting to figure out that it's getting closer and closer to a second or basically sure. straight it's away. it's a second, yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I always thought it was like around three seconds, and mm. I said three seconds to my client so it didn't become too overwhelming, but three seconds is too long. That's like almost double the 1.6 seconds. Yeah. So, basically, within 1.6 seconds of any behavior that happens and there's a consequence that follows it, that's how good the dog can make the connection, good or bad. Yeah. So, um, the 10 seconds is, we call it the disassociation. So, if you're, for example, if the dog was on the other side of this door here and was banging on the door and barking, if I open the door within the 1.6 seconds of the dog doing that behavior. So, within the, within, say, 1.6 seconds of the barking starting. Even like the bark, 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 yeah. bark, and then I open the door while yeah. the dog's doing that behavior. Yeah. He understood, he may have understood that the barking made us open the door. Right. Especially if you're consistent. Over time, every time the dog's barking and you let the dog inside, then the dog has now figured out that barking will let you open the door. So, at first, it may just be a separation thing. Right. He's barking because he's frustrated and unsure and he wants your attention. But then when we start giving a more consistent consequence, then the dog starts figuring out, well, I've got to do this behavior for for something good to follow. Yeah. So, um, and this can come in all sorts of ways. So, for example, if 
your um for say, same thing for punishment. For example, if your dog was to do a rip up your couch, you come twenty minutes later try to get them in trouble. They may look guilty. However, there's no connection to be made. Right. So it has to be in the moment, whatever it is, and we can talk about how to correct the dog appropriately. But um, if you come twenty seconds later and you try to tell them off, there Too is late. no connection, right? right? Same thing with reinforcement, as I said, jumping, nipping, um, and then it comes through with all of the a uh, basic obedience. So this goes across the board with all behaviour for dogs, and um, so you basically got to catch them red-handed. Got to be in the moment, <laughs> man. Very, very important. And that's right. where good management's important. If you want to set your dog up for success and set you up for success, is set up the situation. Is that like what we were talking about last time? You were saying, you know. Um, Say you go out and you've got a puppy and maybe you want to be crate training the dog because, like you said, if they destroy the couch and you come home an hour later, the dog's completely no forgotten about it. So, the, you've, an lost, hour you've is- lost a couch and you can't punish, you can't uh, make a, a negative connection or punish the dog because it's too late. 100%. Right. Even if your dog's outside of the glass door and the dog is barking and you're trying to ignore him, even you looking at the dog has then- Paid, you've paid attention to the dog's behavior, so then it's been reinforced. Because so, they read body language? 100%. Yeah. So, um, reinforcement and punishment can come in so many different ways and forms. It, it really just depends on how the dog sees it, Yeah. which is really important. I noticed that when I came on a couple of client sessions with you, um, of either be my couple of couple of those dogs would be jumping on you, and you you never look at them. You you never aim your body towards them. If they jump on your leg, you just give them a little check with your knee just to get them down yep. without looking at them. That's right. right, because it's all body language. Yeah. So like the dog's jumping on me to get their attention or get my attention. Yeah. First of all, I find it heaps annoying. Second of all, it's not a good behaviour for um and not good manners. Yeah. And um and yeah, as I said, so I could either ignore it, which is a form of punishment, which we'll talk about in a moment, but um. But I choose to walk through into the dog's space. So, for example, like yesterday, this huge staffy jumping up and she like head butted me and like shoved the tongue into my mouth, right? So, it's gross. It's not French nice. Kiss. Yeah, French kiss. <laughs> right? um, and it can be potentially dangerous as well. She's like a 45 kilo dog, right? So, it's, it's dog. pretty intense. So, yeah. as soon as she jumped up onto me, I decided to walk into a space and that then um, created a negative consequence because it's something that she didn't like. But if I walked back or patted her, well, then I then reinforce it. Right. So, um, so, you've got to show dominance in that situation. I guess we don't see it as dominance. I see it more as that behavior has that consequence. Okay. Simple as that. Yeah. If I go down the road of talking about dominance theory and everything, it gets very, very complicated, gets very confusing, and then people take it the wrong way and then they think, well, I have to now dominate the dog for yeah. him to not do it, and that just gets way too confusing. And then, and then we start doing inappropriate things to our dog. So I see it more as one behavior has its consequence, and look, dogs are trying to better their situation all the time. So if it means that the dog has to jump on me to get my attention – and I pay it, well, the dog's going to repeat that behavior. Okay. Um, and it happens. So, yesterday she said, well, everyone pats the dog every time she jumps up. Well, then that's how she figures if I want to get someone's attention, yeah. I've got to jump. So It's like, why are you surprised the dog keeps doing it? Of course. Yeah. 100%. Mm. And, um, and then it gets not just dangerous, but it becomes annoying and then it potentially can manifest into other behaviors. Because well, if a 50-kilo dog jumps on a toddler, that's pretty dangerous, right? 100%. Yeah. Or well, you're standing next to a step and your dog jumps on you. So, so yeah. So, there's times where you should ignore a behavior. So, when I first walk in, like and it happened- um, yesterday morning session, I rocked up into the into the house and the dog was jumping, 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 and then I ignored it because I was doing my paperwork, having a chat with the owners. Within about five minutes, the dog went and laid down and went to sleep. And the comment from the clients were, this never happens. The dog would be annoying for like 25 minutes, even longer. And then the dog then not just starts jumping, but then starts nipping, starts barking at me, and then it, the behavior becomes more intense where I never paid any attention to the dog. So in that moment for that dog, that worked really well. Mm. But then this leads us to the next thing about what what is a marker and how do we be more specific about rewarding behavior. So um, first thing is really important is that you got to use high value food. Yeah. If And when we start charging up this, this command. So mm. high value food. So what I use for training is I use Frankfurts, cut them up into small little pieces, maybe like the size of like half of my pinky nail. Yeah. If it's for a smaller dog, for a larger dog, a little bit bigger. But we don't want to be giving too many big treats because then it makes the dog too full. Mm. And the reason why I use Frankfurt's is because it's a high-value treat, so it tastes really, really good, but it's also a soft treat. So as soon as you give it to them, they swallow it straight away. The reason why I don't use dry treats is that dry treats are boring, so if there's lots of distractions in the environment, the dog's going to be less likely to want to eat like a treat. You mean like a biscuit? Like a liver treat oh, okay. or like, you know, yeah, you get things those Things that like, have been dried. Yeah. yeah. Just, dried meat 
That's right. Dried meat or who Dehydrated knows, meat. Who knows what's in yeah. half the dog food, um, yeah. the doggy treats that you see. So, yeah, so look, barbecue chicken, little bits of steak, little bits of cheese, basically anything that your dog's motivated by that's willing to work for it, sure. especially when there's distractions, is what we use. So, as a dog trainer, I use Frankfurt's because I'm seeing lots of dogs all day. Yeah, you're day. only shredding barbecue chicken all day, every day. <laughs> well, the problem with barbecue chicken too is that first of all, if you're Bones. using the breast, yeah. like no, just for the meat um, components, if you're using breast, um, the breast uh, crumbles everywhere and falls on the floor and becomes very hard to manage. Right. And then if you're using like the leg, it's very oily and gross. So you can use it, but you just got to be a bit more smarter about how you're going to okay. um, deliver that to the mm. dog. So Frankfurt's Frank- are easy. They Frankfurt's work. easy yeah. and you know they're not the most nutritional treat, but hey, a treat's a treat, right? Yeah. And um, so, yeah, and because they're, they're a high value treat, more likely the dog's going to be focused on me in those harder dis- um, environments. So what we're going to do, and this is the first thing that we do, the, the absolute first thing um, in every single session where it's a puppy training, um, obedience training and behavioral issues that we want to start charging this marker up. So what we do is we say the word yes, within 1.6 seconds, we give the dog the treat. Right. Yes and food, yes food, yes So food. is the yes within 1.6 seconds or the food within 1.6 seconds of the yes? Good question. We say the word yes whenever, but then one, within 1.6 seconds, that food has to go into the dog's mouth. Right. So this is first step. There are steps- um, okay. F- step going one. from here. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so step one is that we just want the dog to understand that every time I say that word, yes, we give a treat. Okay. Now, of course, you can use any word you like. You could also use a clicker if you like or a whistle. It could be any sound that the dog then understands. You can also use other stimulus, like some people would use like a different collar, like, you know, using a stimulation on a collar or a vibration on the collar to make the pair. But, um, but in my training, so I don't use, um, any, electric collars um we use my voice so we say the word yes and then we give the treat i noticed also you said to a client that yes should always uh yes should only ever be for food as in you should have a specific one for food that's right right well so the two rules is that um when for me in in the way that i that i train that i set it up because there's different markers for different things yeah so when we first start with the food the word yes means food's on its way. And the rule is you only say the word yes when you're delivering food. Okay. If we want to praise our dog, we say good boy, good girl, and then yep. we give physical praise or just verbal praise. But with my training and what I do with my dogs and with all my clients, the word yes guarantees food's on its way. Okay. So if I said yes in the way that I normally mark my dogs and Ace and um, Spades and Nookie are right here with me, yep. if I said it in that way, they would both look up to me waiting for their food. So people say, well, won't that confuse a dog if I'm saying yes? And how many times have I said yes sitting right here? It's a way that I say it. And I say it with a bit more high pitch and a little bit more sharper. Yep. So they understand that that means that they're going to get rewarded. So the way that I say it to my dogs is not how I say it in general conversation because yeah. it would be a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so at first we don't give the dog any command. We're not get, saying their name or anything. Mm. We're just standing around in the living room. You say that word yes and then you give the treat. Yes and food, yes food, yes food. So over the next couple of days, what will happen if you, if people are consistent is that the dog will be next to you, you say the word yes, and they fling their head up and staring at you, they waiting look. for that treat yeah. to come. So the two reasons why we use this condition marker, first of all, it's that it pinpoints the exact time the dog's done the right behavior for them to learn that whatever they were doing in the moment you said the word yes means that that high value reward's on its way. The second reason is that we want to be able to create a bridge between saying the word yes and delivering the food. So I'll give a quick example. So Spades, my boy, he's a Roddy Shepherd mix, and for the cameras that can't see him, he's a he's, he's an old wise man. Good boy. He's a good boy. 40 kilos of good boy. <laughs> yes, you are. So I had him 20 meters away from me. He was in a down stay, off the lead, under the tree, while I was doing training with my clients. A dog happened to walk past him. He sniffed the air, but he didn't break the down. Mm. And I was happy with that because at the level of training that we were at is that normally he probably would have gotten up to say hi to that dog. But in that case, he didn't. Mm -hmm. So I said the word yes, and he flung his head towards me, and he was waiting for that food to come. So he knew exactly that when I said that word yes, he was going to be rewarded. But it took me 10 seconds to walk up to him to give him the treat. But with the level of his training, and he knew because I've been doing this for some time with him, is that he would wait 10 seconds for that food. And you can see in his body language, he was just staring at me. If I didn't have that marker, the dog walked past him. And if I walked up to him and give him the treat, he's still being rewarded, but he's not being rewarded because he ignored the dog. He may be being rewarded because I'm walking up to him and he's still holding it down. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, um, so using that, so of course, when we first start off, that connection between saying that word, yes, and then giving the food has to be within. So when you're doing it for the first week, 
you, they don't know what yes means. It's just another sound that our face makes. So we say, yes, we give food. Yes, we give food. We tell them to sit. Yes, we give food. And then over time, you'll say the word yes and they'll prick up and then you'll be able to give it to them within two seconds. Mm-hmm. And then over time, as you progress, then that gap between the word yes and that food becomes bigger and bigger. So the function of it is so important. It's a cornerstone to all of the training that I do because there's um, a technique called shaping. So there's free shaping and then there's just ordinary shaping. And what that means is that we – either lure the dog into certain positions. So when we're teaching the sit, you have food in front of the dog's nose, you lure them, lure the treat up over their face. As right. soon as their bum touches the ground, we say sit, yes, reward. Sit, yes, reward. And then over time, we can now start to manipulate the dog's body into certain positions, and that's what we call commands. Okay. If we're doing this 50 years ago, they didn't typically didn't use food, and they use a lot of compulsion and pressure to put the dog into position. Pre- like pressing their bum down? or Pressing their yeah. bum down, using the collar and things like that. So this way of training and this understanding of conditioning has like revolutionized all animal training mm. and um, exclusively it's used within our um, companion animals, but also it's used in with the exotic animals. So for example, you want to teach the lion how to get their um, nails cut or for them to lean up against a fence to get injected or for elephants to do tricks and things like that. So um, that's free shaping. Free mm. shaping means we wait for the dog to show behavior that we're looking for. So let's just say I did this with... Um, I'll give an example. I've done it a few times with. So I had to teach Ace, my old dog, how to. Um, the end goal was that there was ten items, and he had to look for the container that had the scent in it for him to mark it. I mean, for him to indicate that this is the one that we were looking for, and then I would reward him. So how I started with that because that was part of my course yeah. of doing the NDTF. That that was one of the complex skills. So at first, I don't show him. To do it, what I did was I was in the garage where there was nothing on the floor. I had the container with the scent in it, and in this case, it was Vegemite. So it was very easy for him. <laughs> now, um, all I did was I stood in the in the room there, had my food on me, and I just stood there. And he's looking at me. He's like, "Waiting, what are we doing? What are we doing?" As soon as he looked in the direction of the container, I said the word "yes." He goes, "What the hell?" He looked towards me, and I rewarded him. Yeah, and I stood there. He looked towards the container. I re- uh, he said yes, and I rewarded him. Then over time, he started getting closer and closer, and then just as in a nutshell of what free shaping means is that I was able to capture certain behaviors by using this marker to communicate to him that that behavior that you displayed means that I'm about to reward you. And then over time, what he did was so fast forward a couple of days was that he was walking up to the container and butting his nose on it and I'd reward that. And then eventually then the next steps was then adding another container with no scent in it. So he's putting his nose on both so containers. So now he has to pick which one it is, yeah. That's right. So at first it was nothing to do with the scent. He was just doing it just to see how do I get that food. And as soon as he indicated, like he put his nose on the right container, I marked it and rewarded it. Yeah. And then over time he started understanding it was the one with the Vegemite. That's the one. And that's right. how we started understand that's how we started to understand how to discriminate which was the container that he had to put his nose on for me to reward him. And then the end goal was that there was 10 containers and he would put his, he would look, 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 and he would put, do a play bow over the container that, um, that I liked. And again, I shaped that. He happened to do it once, so I marked it. Right. And that's what free shaping is. Shaping in- Free shaping is waiting for the behavior and then marking it? That's right. Right. Yeah. So we do nothing. We just stand there and we wait and we can, and this is such a, um, a revolutionary way of training a dog, but it requires a lot of patience and it's more for, um, complex sort of skills and, um, and yeah, but in terms of like luring a dog, so luring is you have food in your hand, you put the dog in front of the dog's, your hand in front of the dog's nose. And as you start to lure, the dog starts to follow your hand. Yeah. So to st- to teach him what luring is, is that you start moving your hand, he follows, you say, yes, you reward him. Uh, I remember with the, was it a, the Kelpie and we were, tr- he didn't want to have the collar on. And so you would, we took like almost 10, 20 minutes to get mm-hmm. the collar on, but they would hold the collar um you know, in in one hand and put their other hand through it with the food and slowly, repeatedly um, feed him and and each time gradually get the collar more over his, you know, his snout and then his ears and then eventually over his neck. That's right. So, we could have forced the dog to put it on, but this way we know that the dog likes the food. So, we did small baby steps towards our goal. Yeah. So, successive approximation. So, our goal is that the dog puts his own head through the collar. And um, that's how we start to condition the dog. And we also desensitize him to the sensation of going over the head there. So if I had no marker, I could still give him the reward. And there's still training there. You're still training him. But the fact that I'm using that word yes is, is very specific to the dog. The reason why we do this, because we if it was just on that level, then you don't even have to really use a marker, right? Because mm-hmm. you're giving the food, the food's in your hand. The um, the complexity of it and the the reason why we do this is that 
what happens when the dog's not next to you and you don't have the food on you? So let's give an example. Let's just say hypothetically the dog has just started to understand what the marker is. Yeah. And that I say the word yes, he looks up towards me, I go to my pouch, I give him the food. So we're still kind of close to each other. And then let's just say that we want to teach the dog to, let's just say we're having dinner, we're sitting at the table, and um, the dog normally jumps up and tries to steal the food and annoys us and nibbles on our on our feet and does all the attention-seeking behavior that yeah. we find undesirable. So I would teach the bed command, so I would lure the dog into the bed. We'll talk about how to do specific commands in future sessions, but we'll just go in a nutshell yeah. that we teach the dog to go on the bed. We lure the dog into the bed. That Every time the dog goes on the bed, we say, yes, we reward. Bed, yes, reward. Bed, yes, reward. And then through um, training and throughout the days of, of working on that command, we teach the dog that every time he touches our bed, we say the word yes and we reward him. So let's just say the dog understands bed. He also understands the word yes and we're sitting at the table. Instead of the dog jumping up and trying to steal the food and, with, and instead of us trying to punish the dog or yell at him and tell him off, Every time that dog go um, laying on that on the bed, there and we're having dinner, you say the word yes. The dog will look up towards you. You grab your treat and you give it to him. Yeah. So by the time you say the word yes, and then you grab that treat and you give it to him, maybe three seconds. But if you look in the dog's body language, he'll prick up and he'll he look knows. Ears, um, yeah. move forward. The eyes open up, and there you can sometimes see the salivation coming out <laughs> of the mouth, depending on the breed of the dog. So um. So there I'm being very specific. That's the behavior that's making you give the treat. Give me a couple of seconds to get the food and give it to you. Mm-hmm. And then another example would be like, let's just say, and we did this um, with Kelly, with the Kelpie, walking down the street and um, we we're trying to teach her to be on a loose seat next to us. And also we're trying to teach her to stay next to us even if there's other dogs around. So what we're doing is as we're walking, as long as she's in the position that we, we liked, we say the word yes, she um, moves her head up towards her owner her owner then has enough time to go into the pouch, grab the treat, and then give it to her. So because Ash has been working with Kelly over the last couple of months with this, mm. Kelly understands that if I say that word yes, give me three, four, even five seconds to grab the treat and give it to you. But that whole time, the dog's looking up towards Ke- um, Ash waiting for that treat to come. So yeah. this becomes really, really important because we've only got 1.6 seconds and let's just say we're walking and we go, oh, that's the behavior that I like. By the time you go to your pouch and then pull it out and give it to her, she may then be displaying a different behavior. Okay. But if I use that marker and pinpoints that's the moment, then she'll look up and she'll be waiting right. for it to come. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Because we want to be able to um, be tactical about how to give this reward. And um, and as I said, with spades, when because, again, advanced level, he ignored the dog, he held it down. I marked it. He looked at me 10 seconds later. You can see he's still waiting he for the food to come. Yeah, he knows it's coming. That's it. So yeah. I have like that extension cord to be able to, unless I can like slingshot to him within 1.6 <laughs> seconds and he catches it, how do I reward that? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, being specific about when the dog's being rewarded and also creating that bridge. And this becomes, as I said, the cornerstone to all of the training that I do because as much as we need good management and know how to use the right tool and how to control them physically, um, we need to be able to be rewarding them appropriately. Mm-hmm. And, um and it's really important. So the staffy that I was just talking about yesterday, um, when we were, so I went to come see him as a follow-up. So we did puppy training, but then she also went off and did like board and train while they went on holidays with this other trainer. Now, the other trainer, from what I heard, wasn't doing everything wrong, but he wasn't using food as, as much of a reward. So he's using more, um, again, I don't know how he trained or, or anything. So I'm just going to assume from what the owner told me that he was using more compulsion. So right. he was using more pressure for right. the dog to do it. So and he might like pull on the, say, pull on the collar, push the bum, that kind of thing. Yeah. Like, you know, so the dog already had a general obedience because we already taught it from when she was young. Mm. Um, and apparently the dog was really well with him and she didn't look scared or anything. However, when I came and seen her yesterday and the, and the issue was that she was very dog reactive. So she walked very nicely on the lead when they're walking down the street. But as soon as she's seen a dog, another dog, she's up on two feet, she's making the staffy noise. Like, mm. All right, she's doing the backflip, she's barking, she's pulling towards him. And the lady's like, I can't walk anymore, my shoulders are like yeah. pulled out of yeah. position, right? So um, so what we needed to do is when we were exp- uh, seeing what her methods of training were is that she was doing one half of the training in regards to good pressure and, and knowing how to ho- have the collar up high and do all the things that, that are really important, which again, we'll cover these things um in depth later but what happened is she was forgetting to reward the dog when the dog was doing the right behavior Mm. so um so what we did was went for a bit of a walk and i was showing her that when the dog's in the right position don't wait for her to do the wrong behavior then 
punish her for it. Start rewarding the behaviors that you enjoy. Right. So, for example, walk down the street, she's next to you. We say yes. And she remembered the yes, even though it's been two and a half years since I seen her. I What's think in those Frankfurts, man? <laughs> I've, got, I've got the special ingredient, right? <laughs> but, um, but you've seen it. Like, and, I, and I, when I was talking to him, like, have you been consistent with this yes command? Because I don't think they've seen the importance of it. And they go, no, to be honest, we kind of forgot. We kind of tapered off it and we just forgot about it. While I was standing in the backyard with that dog, I said the word yes. She just looked up towards me. Her ears were forward and she was waiting for food. So it had, we've loaded it up from when she was super young. The conditioning was still there. It wasn't 100% sharp as much as I would like um, for a three-year-old dog to know, but it was still there. Mm. So because of that, we didn't have to react was um we didn't have to recharge it up it was already there we just needed to work more on it so what happened was when we're walking down the street and she was next to me i said the word yes she looked up towards me and i rewarded her so start rewarding your dog for the behaviors that you like rather than focusing on the behaviors you don't like okay it's important that we pull our dogs up and provide consequences for behavior that we don't like that's very important only once we've taught the behavior then can you punish a behavior that she doesn't comply with however in this case we, all we had to do was just show her those are the behaviors that I like you to do. If you repeat them more, then something good will happen. Mm-hmm. So then when I pulled spades out of the car and then straight away she pricked up towards me, I did my look command. I got my treat. I lured her towards my face. She looked in my direction. I said, yes, I'm rewarded. I said, look, she looks, yes, and reward. Look, yes, reward. And through this conditioning process, we call this counter conditioning, we show her that every time you stare at the dog in the distance, you look back towards me, I'll reward you. Mm-hmm. And it didn't you take very- in your – Counter conditioning meaning conditioning her away from a bad behavior. If we break down the word, so counter being doing something Opposite, alternate, yeah. and conditioning is trying to create a new habit or re- reflexive action. Mm. So her conditioning at the moment is see a dog, chase React, the dog, yeah. right? Now I want her to go, every time you see a dog, look towards me, I'll reward you. Yeah. You see the dog, look towards me, reward her. Even if she's looking at the dog and I just say yes and reward her, over time she's going to start figuring out every time I see a dog, I look at to you, you're going to give me something, something good. Yeah. This only works if the dog wants a reward, number one. Number okay. two is that it depends how stressed the dog is. She wasn't very stressed. She was just a very excited dog. So um, so my point here in all of this was that while we're out on the walk, and again, remember we're talking about all dogs need a job and we're starting to work on obedience training and, and also working on structured walking is the thing that she has to do when we're out on the walk. So I'm not correcting her for, breaking, for running up towards spades mm-hmm. and trying to jump on him. What I started to show her was, Every time you do the behavior that I enjoy, I'm going to mark and reward you. If she happened to pull in front of me to go up to spades, that's when I'd pull her in line and be like, hey, you got to stay next to me. And we'll talk about how to do that later. I think it's very important. We don't want to get too mm-hmm. many topics all at once. Yeah. But I think that's, that's super important. And that conditioning of that, that yes command is invaluable. It's so, so important because, um, as I said before, you can't walk around with food in your hand. Because if you walk around with food in your hand, your dog sees that there's food in your hand. So then she's only going to do the behavior because she sees the food in your hand. And then, um, and also, um, you want to have good timing. So then eventually, she does all the behaviors even if you don't have food on you. So our goal with all of our training is that dogs do commands without us having to lure them or put pressure on them. They do the command because we tell them to until we release them or we give them something else to do. Mm. So we've always got a goal that we're working towards, but we've got to break all of that down to small biteable chunks so we can get the, um, the results that we want. So... Yeah, as I said, cornerstone to training because um, because we have to be super clean. Mm. Makes sense? It does, yeah. And um, now talking about how to make this association, so I choose to say the word yes because I carry yes everywhere with me. Um, unless I lose my voice, then I have no condition marker. But the fact that the, the likelihood of me losing my voice is a lot slim. Mm. Where a lot of trainers use a clicker. Now I have nothing against clickers. I think clickers are awesome, a very, very good tool. However, in the way that I do training with my dogs and with my clients is that I know, and I've done this in the early days about telling people about clickers and I had clickers to sell, is that people were losing the clickers, they were forgetting the clickers, yeah. the clickers weren't on them. Yeah. The daughter had the clicker, but not the mum. It's just one more, one more variable, isn't it? To, to, you know, we're yeah. trying to make training as simple as possible for, yeah. for everyday dog owners and we want to try to make it. So I've been using the, my verbal command, uh, verbal markers with my dogs the whole time that I've had them and they know exactly what's happening. So we know that it happens, but I do know from the science is that using a mechanical sound compared to a verbal sound triggers a different part of the brain. Hmm. So that clicker creates more of a reflexive action than using the word. Right. 
doesn't so there's mean- there's positives and negatives. For sure. Like anything. 100%. Yeah. So like, you know, like there's, um. so if I was like working a dog for a specific job and it was just me and my dog and I was just working my dog on my own, then using a clicker is a no brainer. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. You can still use a verbal for sure. Even if you're working that dog, verbal still Does works. Does that mean a well. clicker might be quicker to get a- Get the trait as in like uh, as in like to reach a desired behavior. Does the clicker make it quicker because it's a part different part of the brain or not really? I think it just becomes more of a more of a reflex, more of a reflexive yeah. action, or like a more it creates more. Um, maybe it hits the brain a little bit quicker, possibly. Yeah, because the voice they we probably have a couple of seconds or maybe like a microseconds to d- identify what it is that's happening. It could be just like when you hear that song, like it's the same song all the time. So the problem with yes is yes, yes, yes. See how I said yes? <laughs> she looked up towards me. So um, so the way that we say it can be varied. You can when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're sad, when you haven't got much energy, your your voice command is going to change a little bit. Yeah, and that's why it can be a little bit more unreliable. Um, so and again, that's why you try and um, you were saying before you use a different tone on purpose because it's not just a yes, it's a. Yes. That's right. Sp- that's, exactly. that's that's the training tone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I've conditioned myself to say it in a certain way. Regardless of your voice condition or your mood or whatever. For sure. Yeah. And I've also tried to practice it when I'm feeling a little bit off or I'm not feeling – because, like, your dog's going to frustrate you maybe mm. when you're doing something and, and they're doing something you don't like. Yeah. you got to have no emotion or, like, the same stable emotion when you're giving that verbal, where if it was a click or a whistle – It's always the same. It's the same sound, just yeah. like my click of my hand, right? Yeah. So. So, those are the downfalls to it. So, ideally, if you're keen and you're doing all of this and you have a clicker, perfect. Can no you problem. use your fingers or not really? Of course. Yeah. yeah. You can still use that as a, as, yeah. as a condition marker. So there's people that I know that and they use that. Right. Again, you know, it depends on the individual and what they're comfortable with. Okay. You don't have to say, yes, you could say squiggly squabs as long as it's always the same word, then, then it happens. But as in like um, the click of a finger or even making a clicking sound with your mouth, it's mm-hmm. less- um, Verbal or less, it, it and doesn't it's have probably as much more. Of a, it's more mechanical. Yes, hundred I mean. yeah. percent. So it probably would then become a little bit sharper for the dog to understand. So um, at this stage, we use yes because it works. Mm-hmm. Um, depends how deep you want to go with it. Depends how precise you want to be with your dog. Will then depend depend on what you're keen on using in terms of tool. But if we have six family members, and then we have to share that click around, yeah. unless we charge up six different clickers again, we're giving more work to these people that. That that um, necessarily shouldn't be. So, but one thing that's really important. It's and a good I, motto for life, man. Keep it simple, right? One hundred percent. Well, if you want <laughs> it to happen, training then, simple. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. If um, and one thing that I see a lot with my clients is that when they're saying the word yes, and then they give a pat, I'm like, you can't do that. Yes, or your clicker, or whatever it is, has to result in the the reward that the dog's expecting. In my understanding of it, anyway, and from how I see it, I don't. Want, I want to create that that condition marker to be super, super raw. So then it's always creating the same reaction. And if you like a dog, good boy, good girl. And that's where the praise comes in. So um, that's super important. I would hope that you like your dog. (laughs) Well, yeah, you'd be surprised. (laughs) Some people can, their dog um, is complicating their life so much that there's a lot of resentment attached to the dog. So um, It's not the dog's fault though, really, usually, is it? Look, there's some there's some crazy ass dogs out there, right? Mm. But look, I think it's um it's a it's a lack of management, the wrong dog for the wrong home, um, and not doing early training. Like the first thing I do with the puppy, even though I said in the puppy training um, episode last episode was that the first thing you do is you get your dog used to a harness. That's probably incorrect. I think the first thing you do is you charge a yes command, okay. so you can get that harness onto the dog sure. and make a positive association. Yeah. So, in terms of what we do, in terms of a training so, schedule, so yes is really the the. You know, 101, it's the first thing the dog should first learn. First thing we do. Yeah. And it's the first thing I do straight away when I'm in the client's home. Of course, of co- I've got to come into the house and we do our paperwork and we talk a little bit of the theory. Mm. I like when I'm in my sessions with my clients, I want to teach people the why before we start doing the what and the how. Yeah. We want the how even before the what. We just want the dog to stop doing it. But if you don't know why we're doing this, then yes means nothing to them. And it was my client that I've seen in their third session, the penny dropped for her and she was, I finally get this yes thing because at first it's like, oh, is this just a thing that we that you dog trainers do? Right. But once we understand the, uh, this dog was really hard to walk. She was really strong. And, Big dog. Um, she was like a medium sized dog, but she was like a staffy cross Malamar oh, from man. what she looked like. She was just buzzing. Um, and Almost. they hadn't had dogs before, yeah. so she had a really hard dog. Along with that, a very powerful dog and a very high energy dog. And um, and it was very hard for her to walk, but it was only after a little bit. 
you know, about a month and a half. And she still kept up with the yes and she followed my instruction. But now she started to understand why it was working. Mm. We walk down the street. She sees the pigeon across the road. She chooses not to chase it. She says yes. And the dog flings her head up. She's going, yes, I'm getting fed now. Yeah. So, and there's that, that Pavlovian response. 100%. Mm. So, um, so, that's super, super important. So, um, now we talk a little bit about instrumental conditioning, understanding that behaviors have consequences. So, there's four quadrants of um, class, I mean, of instrumental conditioning, and there's positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment. Mm. So understanding that there's four quadrants, what we call it the um, the the, the mat- oh, matrix, the matrix, the matrix of um, of instrumental conditioning. Again, I probably butcher that up, but you know, always hit up Google and get the right terminology. Mm. But um, those four quadrants are really important to understand. So as much as we're talking about markers and we're talking about how to positive reinforce a dog. We also got to understand what's also happening in regards to consequences for dogs. So positive punish, um, positive reinforcement is adding something that's desirable to the dog so we can repeat it for the future. Negative reinforcement um, is more associated with um, using pressure. So, for example, if I've told my dog to sit and she knows how to sit but she chose not to sit, I may apply a little bit of pressure on the collar or I may apply some pressure on her rear end. As soon as she does this desired behavior, I remove the pressure, which is the negative component of the negative reinforcement. Right. And me taking away is reinforcing. Right. So that's so when we talk about positive and negative, we're not talking about positive as being good, negative being bad. We're talking in terms of mathematics. Yeah. Positive adding is and adding subtracting. and subtracting. Yep. So positive reinforcement, I've added something, which is food, which is reinforcing to the dog. Negative reinforcement, applying the undesirable pressure until the dog complies we release the pressure okay positive punishment is adding something undesirable so for example a leash correction if the dog was to pull in front i give a leash correction i've added something undesirable in hope that it would not in hope in order to um lessen the likelihood of it repeating again in the future and the negative punishment is then like what we talked about before when the dog was jumping and we ignore it or the dog's barking at the back door you ignoring the dog is technically Negative punishment because you've removed something, which is your attention or your physical. Or for example, if your dog was um, inside the room here, jumping, 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 you walked out the door and closed the door, that's negative punishment. You've removed yourself, which is negative. Punishment is undesirable. Right. Okay. And then- Yeah, because when I first, when you were first explaining that to me, I mean, off air, I found it a little bit confusing. Again, probably because I was thinking of it as good and bad yep. rather than mathematically. And people say it was like, oh, I use positive reinforcement. Like it's everything's positive, mm. positive. And for sure, th- there there is that element to it because it's supposed to be good feeling. Yeah. But just because I say negative, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Yeah. Um, that's the reinforcement and the punishment side of it. So, reinforcement- is something that strengthens behavior. Punishment is what weakens behavior. Okay. When people say punishment doesn't work, it's an oxymoron. You, you can't say punishment doesn't work. The word punishment means weakening behavior. Mm-hmm. So that's the definition of it. It's it's just people choose not to use punishment. People choose to use more reinforcement. And for example, for me, I think 80, 90% of the training that I do is positive reinforcement. There's gonna And of course, I want to be teaching dogs what to do rather than teaching them what not yeah. to do. But there's going to be times where once I've taught a behavior, they choose not. To. Then, then, then I have to follow through with the correction for it to become more reliable and for the dog to make better decisions. Yeah. But it's important, and this is the most important thing, is that when we're choosing to use punishment in um, training, make sure you're calm and you're cert- and you're assertive, so you're clear and you're not angry, you're not emotional, you're not trying to create fear, you're not trying to intimidate your dog, and you're certainly not supposed to make them feel pain or or to be hurt by it. So you've got to be appropriate. So, for example, when the dog jumped on me and I walked into a space, positive punishment, I've added myself into the situation, which then made it undesirable, and then she stopped doing it. Mm. But then if I then can use my marker, so back making a full circle, I walked into the house, the dog jumped on me, straight away I walked into it nice and firm, and she kind of like lost balance and she um, and she moved away from me. I then said the word yes, and then I rewarded yeah. her. So then she started learning. So you were showing her, don't do this, do this. Exactly. Yeah. I'm giving you a clear option. Now, people say, ignore the dog, turn your back to her. First of all, you do ignore your dog to a 50 kilo dog jumping on you. How do you ignore it? Mm. This is a really important thing. Ignoring a dog is very hard when she's pushing you around or she's biting and you have to actually flinch and move away. The more you move, the more you create a prey drive into the dog and the dog wants to continue chasing or playing that game mm. or persisting to get the attention that she's looking for. So because I'm a balanced trainer, balance means that I'm using all four quadrants of um, instrumental conditioning. I, I'm choosing consciously to use all of those. However, um, 
if I can try to focus on rewarding the behavior that I enjoy rather than punishing the behavior I don't like, I think it becomes more clearer to the dog and more enjoyable for the dog to strive for that behavior. So I only walked into a space twice in yesterday's session and I rewarded her multiple times for, you can see she wanted to jump and then she pulled back down. I marked it and rewarded it. And yeah. she goes, okay, mm. interesting, interesting. Now I could have just ignored her. Now, when people say ignore your dog of jumping, for example, and you turn your back to them, that's not ignoring. Ignoring is you do nothing. Mm. But if I have to turn, I'm reacting, which is not a, technically not part of ignoring. And what happens is, first of all, if I turn my back to the dog, she can push me behind and push me over. But also, she just finds me and jump on me, and then I start playing this little game. So I'm still reacting. She's getting. She, she's got what she wanted in a exactly. way. Exactly. Yeah. We're playing this little little yeah. game with her. So instead, address the behavior. Try not to ignore it too much. There's some there's some behaviors that we ignored, like when we walked up in and we seen Freddie little border collie, and she was, he was jumping, jumping, jumping. I just didn't look at him. Mm. A couple of times he jumped on me. I didn't do anything. He just went and laid down. Because he doesn't weigh fifty kilos, you can ignore him. I can, yeah. I'm more. It's more eff- um, effective to ignore yeah. him for sure. Yeah. And because I did ignore him and he chose the behavior I liked, I marked it. And he's like, ooh. Yeah. And then I rewarded him. Mm-hmm. So I was being very clear. So that's um that's some of the basics of of what of what marker training is. Um, using classical conditioning so we can create but and again, the best example is um now I can give a few examples that happen to us every single day. As I said before, you hear that song and straight away you remind you of yeah. someone because that sound of that song is the exact same. It hasn't changed in the last 20 years. It's the exact same sound. And, and you heard it at a specific moment in time. That's right. What mm. would remind you of somewhere. Or like, you know, sometimes I smell like I walk pa- I drive past a house or like a drive through an area and like something's up with the sewer, sewerage system and it stinks a bit. And it's for, it reminds me of being over in overseas country, right? Yeah, yeah. Where you can smell like more the septic tanks and that. Mm. So sometimes I smell the, the, the weird smell that I'm not used to. But because it reminds me of Thailand, I'm like, oh, wow. So yeah. even if it's a undesirable smell, if it reminds you of something, it creates a connection. Mm. Um, and that smell, that sound, that sensation are all very much the same. Or I guess another example is when, I sm- when I'm walking through Cronulla and I smell the mix of sunscreen and cigarette smoke, it reminds me of Europe every single time, <laughs> right? Because you're po- you are more um, prone to, to have those combination smells while I'm there. So these things happen. They're very subtle but they're powerful. Mm. And as I said before, it's a reflexive action. It just happens. Like, and so one more thing as well before we wrap it up is that I don't just use my classical conditioning of my marker for food. So, for example, Nuki here, she loves the ball. She's very, very motivated for the ball. Yeah, I've seen oh, it. <laughs> you've seen it, right? She's yeah, crazy. She's crazy. She's, so um, because of that, I don't just throw the ball for free and let her just run, run, run. Mm. I use it as um, um, I use it as part of my training. So the ball that I have, I have it in my hand and I'll get to the park, for example. Now, she doesn't know I've got the ball. I'm walking through the park and I tell her to down. She can't see it. It's in your pocket or whatever. It's in my pocket and because she's super small, the ball's like this big, which is awesome. So I have it in my pocket. I tell her to down. She hits it down. I walk off from her. I'm probably walked maybe about, you know, 50 meters from her. And for her and how I've used it is I say the word bang. Bang means that ball's on its way. So she breaks position to in anticipation to get the ball and that's when I throw the ball. Mm. Or I call her to come. So she'd be up there sniffing the tree or saying hi to another dog. I go, Nookie, come. She runs up to me. I say the word bang, and then she knows that I'm going to reward her with the ball. And, um, and of course, in this situation, like let's just call about the recall, is that I don't always reward every single behavior because if I reward every single time on a continuous schedule, one day I stop rewarding, the she behavior will probably it. stop. Yeah. So I think um, people have to be creative with the way that they're training with their dogs. If the dog likes food, you use food. If the dog likes a ball, you use the ball. However... If I'm going to teach specific commands, sits and down and come and bed and the look and a bunch of the basics, I always start with luring with food mm. to get precise um, behaviors and very specific behaviors. Yeah, like you can't be throwing the ball in the living room. Well, how do you teach? You can't lure the dog into a sit with the ball that's too yeah. high energy. Yeah. So once I teach the behaviors and I tell her to sit. So we did it again with the client the other day. He's bought a collie. Um, he wants to take his dog because he's a personal trainer. He wants to take his dog to work with him. So the rule is the dog stays on the bed while they're practicing with um, whatever that they yep. do. Now, the dog likes food or take food, but will do anything for the ball. So once we've taught with food to go onto the bed and we're in Cronulla, we set the bed up, we say bed, the dog went onto the bed and stayed there. We walked off. It was probably about five minutes. The dog stayed on the bed. He said the the word, so he uses bang as well. He yep. says bang. The dog broke position to catch the ball. So we teach passive behaviors for a more active 
uh, reward. reward. Yep. And that way there we're teaching impulse control. We're being specific about what the dog has to do to get the reward. Mm. And, um, and it's very enriching for the dog. So then that way the dog will repeat it for the future. Mm-hmm. With that dog though, if he broke position before we release him by using the release command or by rewarding him with the ball, if he broke position, he would go back up to him. Uh-uh. He grab the collar. He would apply pressure towards the bed. As soon as the dog went back on the bed, he releases the pressure. So negative reinforcement to show him that's the consequence for breaking the bed. Right. So, um, so the goal is eventually that the dog will stay for an hour while the guy's doing his PT session. That's right. While people are walking past and dogs are in the park and everything else. So that that's the goal. So mm-hmm. at this stage, management, that dog's tied up to a tree on a back tie. The dog has to stay on the bed. He gets rewarded intermittently for following and complying with the command. And then if he breaks and he gets um, corrected for it. Mm. And we're going to be in training scenarios where we start with three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, ten minutes, and we gradually go longer and longer. So when you, let's say you want to, like you said, getting longer and longer, what are you guys doing while the dog's holding the down? Do you just wait or? What were we doing? Yeah. Um, we were talking about different things. Sure. Um, we are making different movements. We are walking and we are doing more distance from the dog. Yeah. Um, we are intermittently rewarding sometimes with food. We would say yes and reward. I would then say sometimes bang and throw the ball. So we will make, we are opening it up so it wasn't too predictable mm. yeah not too predictable it was intermittent so the dog is more likely to go i don't know when it's going to happen but it's mm. potentially going to happen mm. and we make the dog a bit of that gambler as we talked about before so then he's trying to figure out how to do it so um that's a little bit of like a crash course on talking about the, um, the market training and using conditioning um again we're evolving in the way that we understand animal behavior so we have to start keeping up the terms with it there's a few other terms as well and like more um scientific or more um precise sort of um, schedules of reinforcement, everything that are going to come as well. But um, I just really want to focus more on around the market. There's going to be other things that we're going to talk about as well, like what's schedules of reinforcement and, you know, different phases of of dog of, of training your dog. But I didn't want to make go into too much detail today. I just mm. want to kind of touch the surface of this one. Yeah. Because I mean, then- you could probably spend hours and hours and hours talking about this stuff. For sure. Yeah. But because we're – the way they are – podcast is being set up where they were trying to go on a progression so then once we now we've talked about what a marker is so when we talk about how to deal with an aggressive dog or reactive dogs or how to teach a recall and if i say you use your marker then people can refer back to this episode so they can understand what we're talking about so we're building a a foundation good foundations and same with dog training the same with 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 our podcast and the same with life that's it man all these are parallels 100 all right good one thanks guys hope you enjoyed the episode and uh we'll see you next time yeah so just don't don't forget hit us up on um instagram um facebook and youtube yep um leave a review on the on the um subscription um podcast that you um yeah wherever you found us yeah wherever you found us and um and yeah. Yeah. And uh, if you want to go a bit deeper, hit up nutrispooches.com.au. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Cheers. Good work.